Chapter 3. Apparent Exceptions. When the case goes bad, the guilty man accepts, and thins his jury all he can. J. Dryden. Many people to whom I mention the Peter Principle do not want to accept it. They anxiously search for, and sometimes think they have found, flaws in my EA archaeological structure. So at this point I want to issue a warning, do not be fooled by apparent exceptions. Apparent exception no. I, the percussive sublimation. What about Walt Blockett's promotion? He was hopelessly incompetent, a bottleneck, so management kicked him upstairs to get him out of the road. I often hear such questions. Let us examine this phenomenon, which I have named the percussive sublimation. Did Blockett move from a position of incompetence to a position of competence? No. He has simply been moved from one unproductive position to another. Does he now undertake any greater responsibility than before? No. Does he accomplish any more work in the new position than he did in the old? No. The percussive sublimation is a pseudo-promotion. Some Blockett type employees actually believe that they have received a genuine promotion, others recognize the truth. But the main function of a pseudo-promotion is to deceive people outside the hierarchy. When this is achieved, the maneuver is counted a success. But the experienced hierarchiologist will never be deceived. Hierarchiologically, the only move that we can accept as a genuine promotion is a move from a level of competence. What is the effect of a successful percussive sublimation? Assume that Block Etz's employer, Kickley, is still competent. Then by moving Blockett he achieves three goals. 1. He camouflages the ill success of his promotion policy. To admit that Blockett was incompetent would lead observers to think, Hickley should have realized, before giving Blockett that last promotion, that Blockett wasn't the man for the job. But a percussive sublimation justifies the previous promotion, in the eyes of employees and onlookers, not to a hierarchiologist. 2 he supports staff morale. Some employees at least will think, if Blockett can get a promotion, I can get a promotion. One percussive sublimation serves as carrot on a stick to many other employees. 3. He maintains the hierarchy. Even though Blockett is incompetent, he must not be fired, he probably knows enough of Kickley's business to be dangerous in a competitive hierarchy. A common phenomenon hierarchiology tells us that every thriving organization will be characterized by this accumulation of deadwood at the executive level, consisting of percussive sublimates and potential candidates for percussive sublimation. One well-known Apple Ants manufacture firm has 23 vice presidents, a paradoxical result. The Waverly Broadcasting Corporation is noted for the creativity of its production department. This is made possible through percussive sublimation. Waverly has just moved all its non-creative, non-productive, redundant personnel into a palatial, $3 million head office complex. The head office contains no cameras, microphones or transmitters, indeed, it is miles away from the nearest studio. The people at head office are always frantically busy drawing up reports and flowcharts and making appointments to confer with one another. Recently a reshuffle of senior officials was announced, aimed at streamlining the headquarters operation. Four vice presidents were replaced by eight vice presidents and a coordinating assistant to the president. So we see that the percussive sublimation can serve to keep the drones out of the hair of the workers. Apparent exception no. 2. The lateral arabesque. The lateral arabesque is another pseudo-promotion. Without being raised in rank, sometimes without even a pay raise, the incompetent employee is given a new and longer title and is moved to an office in a remote part of the building. Our file would prove incompetent as office manager of Cardley Stationery Incorporated after a lateral arabesque he found himself, at the same salary, working as coordinator of interdepartmental communications supervising the filing of second copies of interoffice memos. Automotive Manufacturing File, Case No. 8 Wheeler Automobile Parts Limited has developed the lateral arabesque more fully than most hierarchies. The Wheeler operations are divided into many regions, and at last count, 
I found that 25 senior executives had been banished to the provinces as regional vice presidents. The company bought a motel and ordered one senior official to go and run it. Another redundant vice president has been laboring for three years to write the company's history. I conclude that the larger the hierarchy, the easier is the lateral arabesque. A case of levitation The entire 82-man staff of a small government department was moved away to another department, leaving the director, at $16,000 a year, with nothing to do and nobody to supervise. Here we see the rare phenomenon of a hierarchical pyramid consisting solely of the capstone, suspended aloft without a base to support it. This interesting condition I denominate the free-floating apex. Apparent exception no. 3. Peter's Inversion A friend of mine was traveling in a country where the sale of alcoholic beverages is a government monopoly. Just before returning home he went to a government liquor store and asked, how much liquor am I allowed to take back home with me? You'll have to ask the customs officers at the border, said the clerk. But I want to know now, said the traveler, so that I can buy all the liquor that is permissible, and yet not buy too much and get some of it confiscated. It's a customs regulation, replied the clerk. It's nothing to do with us. But surely you know the customs regulation, said the traveler. Yes, I know it, said the clerk, but customs regulations are not a responsibility of this department so I'm not allowed to tell you. Have you ever had a similar experience, ever been told, we don't give out that information? The official knows the answer to your problem, you know that he knows it, but for some reason or other, he won't tell you. Once, taking a professorship at a new university, I received a special identification card, issued by the payroll department of the university, entitling me to cash checks at the university bookstore. I went to the store, presented my card, and proffered a $20 American Express traveler's check. We only cash payroll checks and personal checks, said the bookstore. Cashier. But this is better than a personal check, I said. It's better even than a payroll check. I can cash this in any store even without this special card. A traveler's check is as good as cash. But it's not a payroll check or a personal check, said the cashier. After a little more discussion, I asked to see the manager. He listened to me patiently, but with a faraway expression, then stated flatly. We do not cash traveler's checks. You have heard of hospitals which spend precious time filling in sheaves of forms before helping accident victims. You have heard of the nurse who says, wake up. It's time to take your sleeping pill. You may have read of the Irishman, Michael Patrick O'Brien, who was kept for 11 months on a ferry boat plying between Hong Kong and Macau. He did not have the correct papers to get off at either end of the trip, and nobody would issue them to him. Particularly among minor officials with no discretionary powers, one sees an obsessive concern with getting forms filled out correctly, whether the forms serve any useful purpose or not. No deviation, however slight, from the customary routine, will be permitted. Professional automatism The above type of behavior I call professional automatism. To the professional automaton it is clear that means are more important than ends, the paperwork is more important than the purpose for which it was originally designed. He no longer sees himself as existing to serve the public, he sees the public as the raw material that serves to maintain him, the forms, the rituals and the hierarchy. The professional automaton, from the viewpoint of his customers, clients or victims, seems incompetent. So you will no doubt be wondering, how do so many professional automatons win promotion? And is the professional automaton outside the operation of the Peter Principle? To answer those questions I must first pose another, who defines competence? A question of standards The competence of an employee is determined not by outsiders but by his superior and the hierarchy. If the superior is still at a level of competence, he may evaluate his subordinates in terms of the performance of useful work, for example, the supplying of medical services or information, the production of sausages or table legs or achieving whatever are the stated aims of the hierarchy. That is to say, he evaluates output. But if the superior has reached his level of incompetence, he will probably rate his subordinates in terms of institutional values, 
he will see competence as the behavior that supports the rules, rituals and forms of the status quo. Promptness, neatness, courtesy to superiors, internal paperwork, will be highly regarded, in short, such an official evaluates input. Rockman is dependable. Luber contributes to the smooth running of the office. Rudder is methodical. Miss Trudgeon is a steady, consistent worker. Mrs. Friendly cooperates well with colleagues. In such instances, internal consistency is valued more highly than efficient service, this is Peter's inversion. A professional automaton may also be termed a Peter's invert. He has inverted the means and relationship. Now you can understand the actions of the Peter's inverts described earlier. If the liquor store clerk had promptly explained the customs regulations, the traveler would have thought, how courteous. But his superior would have marked the clerk down for breaking a rule of the department. If the bookstore cashier had accepted my traveler's check, I would have considered him helpful, the manager would have reprimanded him for exceeding his authority. Promotion prospects for Peters inverts The Peters invert or professional automaton has, as we have seen, little capacity for independent judgment. He always obeys, never decides. This, from the viewpoint of the hierarchy, is competence, so the Peters invert is eligible for promotion. He will continue to rise unless some mischance places him in a post where he has to make decisions. Here he will find his level of incompetence. Superscript 1 We see therefore that professional automatism, however annoying you may have found it, is not, after all, an exception to the Peter principle. As I often tell my students, competence, like truth, beauty and contact lenses, is in the eye of the beholder. Apparent exception no. 4. Hierarchical exfoliation. Next I shall discuss a case which to untrained observers is perhaps the most puzzling of all, the case of the brilliant, productive worker who not only wins no promotion, but is even dismissed from his post. Let me give a few examples, then I will explain them. In Excelsior City every new schoolteacher is placed on one year's probation. K. Buckman had been a brilliant English scholar at the university. In his probationary year of English teaching, he managed to infuse his students with his own enthusiasm for classical and modern literature. Some of them obtained Excelsior City Public Library cards, some began to haunt new and used book stores. They became so interested that they read many books that were not on the Excelsior School's approved reading list. Before long, several irate parents and delegations from two austere religious sects visited the school superintendent to complain that their children were studying undesirable literature. Buckman was told that his services would not be required the following year. Probationer Teacher C. Cleary's first teaching assignment was to a special class of retarded children. Although he had been warned that these children would not accomplish very much, he proceeded to teach them all he could. By the end of the year, many of Cleary's retarded children scored better on standardized achievement tests of reading and arithmetic than did children in regular classes. When Cleary received his dismissal notice he was told that he had grossly neglected the bead stringing, sandbox and other busy work which were the things that retarded children should do. He had failed to make adequate use of the model link clay, pegboards and finger paints specially provided by the Excelsior City Special Education Department. Miss E. Beaver, a probationer primary teacher, was highly gifted intellectually. Being inexperienced, she put into practice what she had learned at college about making allowances for pupils' individual differences. As a result, her brighter pupils finished two or three years' work in one year. The principal was very courteous when he explained that Miss Beaver could not be recommended for permanent engagement. He knew she would understand that she had upset the system, had not stuck to the course of studies, and had created hardship for the children who would not fit into the next year's program. She had disrupted the official marking system and textbook issuing system, and had caused severe anxiety to the teacher who would next year have to handle the children who had already covered the work. The paradox explained. These cases illustrate the fact that, in most hierarchies, supercompetence is more objectionable than incompetence. Ordinary incompetence, as we have seen, 
is no cause for dismissal, it is simply a bar to promotion. Supercompetence often leads to dismissal, because it disrupts the hierarchy, and thereby violates the first commandment of hierarchical life, the hierarchy must be preserved. You will recall that in Chapter 2 I discussed three classes of employees, the incompetent, the moderately competent and the competent. At that time, for simplicity's sake, I chopped off the two extremes of the distribution curve and omitted two more classes of employees. Here is the complete curve. Employees in the two extreme classes, the supercompetent and the superincompetent, are alike subject to dismissal. They are usually fired soon after being hired, for the same reason, that they tend to disrupt the hierarchy. This sloughing off of extremes is called hierarchical exfoliation. Some horrible examples I have already described the fate of some supercompetent employees. Here are some examples of super incompetence. Miss P. Saucier was hired as a salesgirl in the appliance department of the Lowmark department store. From the start she sold less than the average amount of merchandise. This alone would not have been cause for dismissal, because many other salespeople were below average. But Miss Saucier's record keeping was atrocious, she punched wrong keys on the cash register, accepted competitors' credit cards and, still worse, inserted the carbon paper with the wrong side up when filling in a sales contract form. She then managed to give the customer the original of the contract. He left with the two records, one on the front of the contract and the other in reverse on the back, and she was left with none. Worst of all, she was insolent to her superiors. She was dismissed after one month. W. Kirk, a Protestant clergyman, held radical views on the nature of the deity, the efficacy of the sacraments, the second coming of Christ, and life after death, views sharply opposed to the official doctrines of his sect. Technically, then, Kirk was incompetent to give his parishioners the spiritual guidance they expected. He received no promotion, of course, nevertheless he retained his post for several years. Then he wrote a book which condemned the stodgy church hierarchy and propounded a reasoned argument favoring taxation of all churches. He asked that ecclesiastical recognition be extended to such social problems as homosexuality, drug abuses, racial injustices and the like. He had moved, at one jump, from incompetence to superincompetence, and was promptly dismissed. The superincompetent exfoliate must have two important characteristics. 1. He fails to produce, output. 2. He fails to support internal consistency of the hierarchy, input. Is exfoliation for you? We see, then, that supercompetence and superincompetence are equally objectionable to the typical hierarchy. We see, too, that hierarchical exfoliates, like all other employees, are subject to the Peter Principle. They differ from other employees in being the only types who, under present conditions, are subject to dismissal. Would you like to be somewhere else? Is your present placement in military service, school or business your choice or are you a victim of legal or family pressure? With planning and determination you, too, can make yourself either super competent or super incompetent. Apparent exception no. 5. The paternal instep. Some owners of old-fashioned family businesses used to treat their sons like Reg Ular employees. The boy would start at the bottom of the hierarchy and rise in accordance with the Peter Principle. Here, of course, the owner's love for his EA Archie, his desire to keep it efficient and profitable, and his stern sense of justice, outweighed his natural familial affections. Often, though, The owner of such a business would bring his son in at a high level with the idea that in time, without rising through the ranks, he should take over the supreme command or, as the phrase went, should step into his father's shoes. This type of placement, therefore, I call the paternal instep. There are two principal means by which the paternal instep is executed. P. I.S. Method No. 1. An existing employee may be dismissed or removed by lateral arabesque or percus of sublimation, to make a place for the instepper. Used less often than method no. 2. This technique may cause considerable ill feeling toward the new appointee. p. is method no. 2. A new position, with an impressive title, 
is created for the instepper. The method explained the paternal instep is merely a small-scale example of the situation that exists under a class system, where certain favored individuals enter a hierarchy above the class barrier, instead of at the bottom. Squared the infusion of new employees at a high level may sometimes increase output. The paternal instep, therefore, arouses no ill feeling outside the hierarchy. Yet the arrival of the instepper is to a degree resented by other members of the hierarchy. Employees actually have a sentimental feeling, Peter's penchant, for the promotion process by which they themselves have risen and by which they hope to rise further. They tend to resent placements made by other means. The paternal incept today the family business, controlled by one man with the authority to place his sons in its higher ranks, is nowadays something of a rarity. Nevertheless, the paternal instep is still executed in just the same way, except that the instepper need not be related to the official who appoints him. Let me cite a typical example. Paternal instep file, case no. 7a, Purefoy, director of the Excelsior City Health and Sanitation Department, found that by the end of one financial year he was going to have some unexpended funds. The citizens had suffered no epidemics. The Excelsior River had not, as it often did, overflowed its banks and silted up the drainage system, both his assistant directors, one for health, the other for sanitation, were earnest, competent, economically minded men. So the budgeted funds had not been spent. Purefoy realized that unless he took rapid action he would suffer a cut in the coming year's budget. He determined to create a third assistant directorship whose incumbent would organize an anti-litter and city beautification program. To fill the new post he engaged W. Pickwick, a young graduate from the School of Business Administration of his own alma mater. Pickwick, in turn, created 11 more new posts, an anti-litter supervisor, six litter inspectors, a three-girl office staff, and a public relations officer. N. Wordsworth, the P. R. O organized essay contests for school children, adult contests for jingles and poster designs, and commissioned two films, one of anti-litter propaganda, the other on city beautification. The films were to be made by an independent producer who had been with Wordsworth and Pickwick in the University Dramatic Society. Everything worked out well, director Purefoy exceeded his budget and was successful in obtaining a larger budget for the following year. Modern father substitutes nowadays government set up the father shoe situation. Federal grants are offered for many new purposes, war on pollution, war on poverty, war on illiteracy, war on loneliness, war on illegitimacy and research into the recreational potential of interplanetary space travel for the culturally disadvantaged. As soon as money is offered, a way must be found to spend it. A new position is created, anti-poverty coordinator. Head Start Director, Book Selection Advisor, Organizer for Senior Citizens Welfare and Happiness Projects, or what have you. Someone is recruited to occupy the position, to wear, if not necessarily to fill, the shoes. The instepper may or may not solve the problem that he was set to solve, that does not matter. The important point is that he must be able and willing to spend the money. The principle not breached such a placement is in accordance with the Peter principle. Competence or incompetence is irrelevant so long as the shoes are filled. If they are filled competently the instepper will in time be eligible to step up and out of them and find his level of incompetence on a higher plane. Conclusions The apparent exceptions are not exceptions. The Peter principle applies to all employees in all hierarchies. 